Given recent market volatility and the unnerving news related to the downgrade of U.S. debt, we wanted to give clients an update on two major fronts. One, our approach to the financial markets, and two, a summary of the problems facing global policymakers. Since we place a significant weight in our decision-making process on historical studies of markets and several risk-reward models that we have developed based on those studies, we wanted to address a question that comes up from time to time, especially during volatile periods or during the transition from a bull market to a bear market. Are your market models broken? On February 13, 2008, with the S&P 500 trading at 1348, we sent clients an update with the title, Technical Breakdowns Call for More Hedging. In that update, we wrote, Based on recent technical breakdowns in many risk-based investments, the probability of investors occurring additional losses over an extended period of time has increased. The technical and fundamental outlook now favors bearish outcomes over bullish outcomes. Make a mental note of the date, February 13th, and the level of the S&P 500, 1348. We'll revisit those shortly. Let's fast forward now to June 12th of 2009. When the S&P 500 was trading at 946, we sent clients an update titled, If it looks like a bull, walks like a bull, and acts like a bull. In that update, we wrote, No one, including us at CCM, can definitively say a new bull market has or has not started. Only time and future market action will tell. However, we can confidently state that what has transpired since the March 2009 lows compares very favorably with the end of a bear market and the beginning of a new bull market. Right, what we're looking at here is the S&P 500 index. This is 2007, 2008, all the way up to 2011. This blue line is the 200-day moving average that we talk a lot about. Notice here, stock market above the 200-day moving average. Odds still favor higher highs. Crosses over here, rolls over. Odds favor lower lows. Get the reverse here. We're in a bull market. Now, let's talk about are the models broken or have they helped us in the past? Here's where we made the bearish call in February of 2008. After the models helped us make a bearish call right here, and we said the odds now favor lower lows, stocks did indeed fall over 50% after we made the call right here to these lows in March of 2009. Here's where the models helped us make a bullish call where we basically said the odds now favor higher highs. After we made the bullish call in here in June of 2009, the S&P 500 gained 45% roughly up to this high right here. Now, there's a few takeaways here about are the models broken and do we know what we're doing? Because we, we understand and respect that there are times in the stock market where you don't look like you know what you're doing. But let me explain why that happens under our models and under our systems. It's somewhat built into the model. So if you understand that, it's not as concerning. It's always concerning and always unnerving for everyone, myself included, when the markets aren't doing well. But I understand how the models work, so I also understand that they're really not broken. Let's revisit the bull market here. What you do during a bull market with our models is you give the bull market the benefit of the doubt because the odds favor higher highs. So, for example, here... In this downturn here, you try to stay with the market, stay invested during the correction, because if you do, you're able to capture the gains with these higher highs. Eventually, when a bull market ends and rolls over, our models in here still give the bull market the benefit of the doubt. And this is the area where you frankly look like you don't know what you're doing. You look kind of stupid for a while. It doesn't feel good. You stay with the bull here because the models are still telling you that the odds favor higher highs. And if you're in a bull market, you're supposed to stay in this market because you'll probably end up up here. Eventually, the market rolls over enough where the models start to tell you, hey, you know what? 
The odds don't favor higher highs anymore. Now they favor lower lows. So there is a period here in the model where you don't look like you know what you're doing and it looks like the models are broken. Eventually the model says, look, you can't stay with this anymore. Now you got to get defensive, even though you gave it the benefit of the doubt down here and gave back some gains. Same thing occurs here. The model tells you here to be skeptical of this rally because the odds still favor lower lows. There's a period in here with the models where you don't look like you know what you're doing and you look kind of stupid. Eventually the models turn and they say, okay, now the odds seem to favor higher highs, so instead of giving the bear market the benefit of the doubt, you give the bull market the benefit of the doubt. Some other takeaways. Last summer, in 2010, we had some pretty sharp declines. And you'll remember in here, if you go back and read what we said to clients, we said that we were sitting on a fine bull bear demarcation line. That's kind of where we are today. Here, you try to stay with these markets because you believe that you're going to reach a higher high. It became very shaky in here, and that's where we are now. It's somewhat uncertain. The odds are, are still favoring higher highs in this market right here, but they're very, very, very close to slipping into this territory where they favor lower lows. What happened here was the Fed came in in late August of 2010, I believe it was August 27th, giving their Jackson Hole speech, and they hinted at QE3. Luckily, our models told us not to give up on this market. We were able to migrate back towards risk, and thankfully at the end of the year, we were in the black and made money. We're in a similar situation here as we were here. We're sitting on that fine bull bear line. We looked like we didn't know what we were doing here. As it turns out, the models were right. It was smart to, to try to hang with this market because we did make higher highs. You can see the 200-day moving average is, is rolling over here. This is a bad sign. It's somewhat similar to where we were here. We're still in this area today. It's not time to fully give up on this market. And ironically, the Fed's Jackson Hole speech, which was given in here, is coming up again in late August of this year. So we're going to have to be a little bit patient here. So. What are we going to do going forward? We're going to do one of two things. The models are either going to roll over and we're going to migrate to a bearish position or the market's going to remain above that fine bull bear demarcation line and we're going to migrate back towards a more bullish stance. Right now, every day that passes, it's appearing more and more likely that, that we're going to roll into something like this. We're just not there yet. Now some other takeaways are, notice this, here's where the models correctly made a bearish call. But notice after that happened, there's a sharp rally here where again it, it looks like you don't know what you're doing. But notice here where the rally failed. It failed at the 200-day moving average. Here the rally didn't fail at the 200-day. So this was a a big indication that this market may go on and make higher highs. So even if our models come to a bearish conclusion somewhere in here, we could rally all the way back to this 200-day moving average and still be right. So what we're telling you there is even if we make a de more definitive bearish call, which we have not made yet, it's possible that we shouldn't move to 100% cash position yet because we could experience a rally like this back to this blue line in this area. And then you do one of two things there. When you get here, that's when you evaluate. Do I want to sell the rest of my positions? Do I want to hedge those positions in some way? Or is this market looking healthy enough where I want to hold my stock positions and possibly add to them? Very, very difficult to see where we're going. If you put a gun to my head right now and said, Chris, you got to pick one or the other, given the fundamental backdrop and where we are big picture, I believe that we're moving more and more 
closer to an outcome like this. But I have to admit, I felt the same way in here and the Fed was able to print money and bail out the market. So we're just going to have to show some patience. The models aren't broken. They look like they're broken sometimes in these areas. Didn't look, look very smart to stay with this market here. It ended up being the right thing to do. So we're just going to have to see what happens, keep an open mind, and manage accordingly. Let's shift gears here to focus some of our time on, on the fundamental issues facing the global economy. Why did the markets sell off so rapidly? Governments around the globe built entitlement programs, pensions, and budgets based on boom time economic growth and tax receipts. Even under favorable economic conditions, most developed nations would still have a significant mismatch between the promises they've made like Social Security and Medicare and future projected tax receipts to keep those promises. Numerous countries such as the United States, Greece, Spain, and Italy must continuously raise money by selling newly issued bonds to balance money coming in and money going out. With persistent problems in the labor markets and slow economic growth, bond investors have been questioning the ability of countries to keep all their promises, especially promises made to current bondholders. The budget issues that we just spoke of have been well documented for some time. So a fair question becomes, why is all this coming to a head now? There are three main drivers or answers to that question. One would be weak economic growth. The second one would be that governments have limited options available to them to try to stimulate the economy. And the third one would be there's a waning confidence level in the Federal Reserve or central bankers' ability to potentially continually bail out the economy time after time. They were able to do it in 2009. They were able to do it again in the summer of 2010. And the jury is still out as to whether European central bankers and the Federal Reserve here in the United States can pull another rabbit out of their hat and get these markets to stabilize and possibly go on to make higher highs. The biggest issue is weak economic growth. Recently, we had revisions uh, announced for first quarter economic growth in the United States, and they revealed a, a weaker than expected economy, which is hovering, frankly, around what's known as stall speed. Now, think of an airplane, a jet, it has to maintain a certain speed. If it drops below that speed, it, it starts to fall. The economy is the same way. You've got a growth level somewhere in the neighborhood of one to two percent that's needed to keep the economy aloft. Over the past two years, policymakers have attempted to prime the economic pump via more deficit spending and asset purchase programs, which have been fueled by printed money. Governments have tried to grow their way out of this mess, thinking if they can get the economy turned around, tax receipts will increase, and they'll have some time to get their fiscal house in order. During the 2007 to 2009 financial crisis and in the aftermath, the United States government increased deficit spending on a massive scale in the hopes of priming that economic pump. While deficit spending helped improve economic and financial market conditions over the past two years, it did not address structural economic problems. If the problem in 2007 was too much debt, and you take on more debt to stimulate sustainable economic growth, you better get sustainable economic growth. The growth currently does not appear to be sustainable, and the financial markets, no bailouts and massive stimulus spending, are really off the table now, especially given the recent downgrade to the debt rating of the United States. The financial markets are also well aware that global central bankers like the Fed are down to a very short list of options. Interest rates have been at near zero levels from a policy standpoint for some time, and the economy and financial markets are still having trouble gaining traction. Weak economic growth, high unemployment, and fragile financial markets in a zero rate environment tells us something. We, we've got a serious structural problem we're still facing globally, problems plural. If the economy and markets can't keep their balance in these ultra-loose 
monetary conditions, you really have to say, look, something has got to be wrong here. The depth of the problems that we face may be too great to print our way out of it this time. The material in this video has no regard to the specific investment objectives, financial situation, or particular needs of any viewer. This video is presented solely for informational purposes and is not to be construed as a solicitation or offer to buy or sell any security or any related financial instruments, nor should any of the content be taken as investment advice. Any opinions expressed in this video are subject to change without notice, and Shivako Capital Management, LLC, or CCM, is not under any obligation to update or keep current the information contained herein. CCM and its respective officers and associates or clients may have an interest in the securities or derivatives of any entities referred to in this material. CCM accepts no liability whatsoever for any loss or damage of any kind arising out of the use of all or any part of this material. We recommend that you consult with a licensed and qualified professional before making any investment decision.